Okay, so you wanted me to talk about my involvement in, in volunteering, etc., in Cardiff. Please. Well, I, you can probably tell from the accent that I'm not, uh, I'm not a South Walian born, although I'm very much a, uh, a Welshman now. I came here right at the end of 1971 and moved into, into Cardiff and immediately started to make links. I was always a very um, a person on, very much on the radical left, so I had a couple of contacts people gave me, went to see them, met them in the, uh, in, in the basement bar, I don't think it's there anymore, it's the Angel Hotel, and we started talking about the, the things that they were doing here, and that's when I discovered and then got involved with the Cardiff People's Paper. Now the Cardiff People's Paper was what at the time we would have called, well we did call it, a, you know, a collective, it was just a, a loose group of people who came together to put the paper together. Um, we'd probably call it a, a more of a cooperative now. We'd probably call it a publishing co-op now. But it was, it was totally loose. There wasn't any sort of legal form to it. People just came together on a regular basis and produced a, a newspaper. And, and we printed up about 1,500 copies roughly monthly. Um, no external funding whatsoever. Um, nobody got paid for anything. It was entirely a a volunteer effort of, of producing the paper and selling the paper and it just relied on I think it was six old pence or whatever it was at the time. Now we were decimalised so it, it can't have been that. Decimalisation was in 71. The paper had been going when I joined it for about three years something like that and it was very much uh, campaigning about tenants issues so it whatever whatever great issues were coming up um, that's what it, it focused in on. So, we and, and the sales tended to reflect then, um, where, wherever the issues were really. So there were huge issues in the Tlanedin Pentwin estate, because it had what was thought of as very radical at the time. It had a centralised um, boiler system, and, and heated all of the houses based on the Scandinavian model of, of centralised heating. Unfortunately, in Scandinavia, they tend to live in large blocks of um, flats. So running the pipe work is quite easy. Um, with individual houses up on a hillside, the pipe work was all under gardens and, uh, and it leaked. There were some wonderful tales about people's great success growing tomatoes and cucumbers where the soil was so warm. <laughs> but it was a hopeless system. So we campaigned there quite a bit. You know, we wrote quite a bit about those problems and therefore um, we sold. We sold door to door and we sold through a, a network of, of sympathetic news agents who took it on sale or return, obviously they, they, we, we gave them a margin, but the, the amount of money they made was minimal compared to the space that they, they committed to displaying it. So they were great support as well. We campaigned through Butte Town about, and Grange Town about some of the issues on, on regeneration. Um, we did quite a lot in, in Riverside, but the, the really big thing that really took up most of the effort and, and on which I think we had the greatest success was the Hook Road. Now the Hook Road was this magnificent scheme to produce a dual carriageway that would start up more or less where the, where the motorway is now and streak down through northern Cardiff, right the way down through King Coyd, and right the way down through Roth and Plas Newith. And then it had a little bit of a bend at the end where it joined Newport Road, hence it got its name, the Hook Road. Well, it, it was a completely bonkers scheme because there was no thought about where these cars would go. They were all streaming at the city centre and then what was going to happen to them? You know? It was going to destroy 1,500 houses and we campaigned very strongly against that and uh, had support from, from all sides, including the Labour and Tory party, both campaigning against it, both realising 1,500 houses, 5,000 people, that's an awful lot of disruption. And, uh, and we won, we got the, we got the road uh, abandoned in the end, so, so that was a great, uh, a great success. But we campaigned on, on lots of other issues and, and it was a very, um, a very interesting production process that we had, as I said, you know, we were all volunteers, so and we, and we did everything, so we tried. We sold a bit of advertising, but not a huge amount. Um, we sold door to door. Um, we found local printers, and, and eventually couldn't find a local printer, and, and went elsewhere. And uh, and we did all the layout ourselves. It was back in the days of uh, of typewriters and cow gum and bits of paper and letter set, and you know we would spend a whole weekend in one person's house or another, crawling all over the living room floor pasting all this stuff together and, and, and furiously writing it and nobody had typewriters particularly so we had one typewriter between us, one guy who could type pretty well and a couple of others who could type badly and uh, we just bashed it out, you know, it was 
48 hours of continuous hard work, then rush it off to the printers, then get it back and, and try and sell it. And we had great difficulty with printers to start with. As I said, we, you know, we started with local printers. And um, they'd take one look at it, or there'd be a little bit of legal tussle over something or other, and they'd say, no, we don't want to touch it anymore. So eventually we ended up at the, uh, the Russell Press in Nottingham. So my, my job, I was the one who had the van, my job was to drive up to Nottingham every month or so. Uh, we used to send the stuff up on a, on a courier, and then uh, the artwork, and then I would go and collect the actual printed press paper from the press which is fascinating they're lovely people part of the Bertrand Russell Peace Foundation very very sympathetic very helpful to us but it was a long way and it cost a lot of money and eventually we got a, a local printer Cleggland Press and uh, down, down based down in, in Riverside and they did it for us on a, on a regular basis but they could only print a small edition so we became a sort of mini tabloid whereas before we'd been a full-size paper so that uh, that sort of you know that led on to other other campaigns um one campaign that we had that came out of the out of the paper and again had some successes was what we called the free the buses campaign which really attracted quite a lot of attention got interviewed on on bbc radio for that um put on a, a, a big event in the quarry hall the quarry hall not there of course anymore been been demolished i don't know, I think how many decades now but uh, didn't quite fill the Corley Hall, but we got a few hundred people along and, uh, and got a, a live broadcast from that and, and interviews afterwards. And that was when one of us was just doing a bit of research and looking at the, the accounts for Cardiff Bus. It was still being run in-house in the council. It's, it's still, of course, uh, one of the few bus companies that isn't totally privatised because although it's run by a private company, the company is owned by the council. So it's, it's one of the very few left in Britain, really, that still has some some local authority control. But we looked at it and we realised that back in those days you had drivers and conductors and we realised that they were paying more in wages to the conductors than they were actually taking in fares. So it, it made logical sense from, a, from an economist's point of view to just get rid of the conductors and just let people get on and off the bus for nothing. Now that's pretty controversial for trade unions because that meant a loss of jobs. So we went to see the, the T&G um, shop stewards that organised Cardiff Bus and said, look, we've got this idea, what do you think about it? And they said, it's great. And they backed it, which was quite surprising really, but they, they backed it on the basis that there would be so many more people getting on the bus. There would have to be more buses and, and they would work on the basis that there would be an agreement to retrain the conductors to become drivers. So they backed that. Obviously, as you know from getting on and off a carded bus and paying money, that we never quite succeeded in getting it free. It did start the process of moving to one-person operation. Um, but the, the crucial success I think that we got was a, a radical change to some of the bus routes, because every single bus route at the time was radial, and we put forward as part of that campaign um, what, we, what we saw as a, as a logical thing was that we should have a bus that joined the hospitals together. So a bus that started at the CRI, ran up to the Heath, went to, to Valindra, and then out, out west and picked up a little tiny cottage hospital that was still there in Fairwater. So it was, a, it was a circular route around the city. And of course the circular route that joins the hospitals is still there. So, so that, was a, that was a major success. Um, part of the process um, that, that also got me interested um, in the whole print business, because I wasn't a printer, I was an engineer, and I worked in power stations for quite a few years when I, when I came to South Wales. Um, but I always, I, I enjoyed dabbling in printing, I'd done a bit of silk screen printing on a totally amateur basis, doing a few posters. Um, I don't think I ever did any posters for the people's paper, we, we always had quite large print runs, and silk screening was fine for doing 50 posters or 100 posters, but not any good for, for, for many, many more. Um, but I got an interest in it and, and one day I decided, because of the difficulties we had with, with printing the paper, that I'd have a go at starting a printing co-op. So, um, did, did what you do, bought a printing press, bought a book telling me how to work it, <laughs> and then tried to work out how to work it. But unfortunately, although we got the printing press up and running and the, and the printing co-op became quite a, a leading and, and quite well-known radical um, printers, fingerprints, that people right the way across South Wales um, 
still remember some people anyway. Um, we didn't do it in time because the People's Paper had finally given up the ghost and, and stopped before we bought the printing press. So although there was a sort of aim that we would eventually print up Cardiff People's Paper, we never got to do that. But through that, the, 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 at the start, we had this tiny little litho press, but we also had a very nice silk screen press. So we were able to produce some posters and we really got into doing all sorts of posters for all sorts of people, trade unions, charities, campaigning issues. And one of the things we realized that we could do, and, and, and that was to say before we got the, the printing press, but when we were doing some screen printing, is we could do some stuff that would raise some money for local groups. And that's when we came up with this idea of, of real live music. And uh, Terry Dimmick, who's a very keen photographer and, and filmmaker, um, had become involved with the paper and he went out and took some lovely pictures of street musicians and we used those as the basis of a, of a poster and we started this enormous poster campaign that really made the made the thing kick off you know it's a sort of it's the twitter feed of of previous generations really fly posting was really quite common in cardiff there was still in the city center an awful lot of boarded up shops that have been some of them were, were bomb sites still from the war um, others were just shops that were, were changing hands or whatever. And fly posting, although completely illegal, was just ignored, really. Um, the top rank, the, uh, you know, the big, um, the big sort of disco club that was on, on Queen Street, paid a, a professional fly poster. And um, Mike, I think his name was. And, and he did stuff for some of the other venues as well. And there was a couple of big screen printers were producing all these printers printed posters so there was a lot of a lot of fly posted music posters everywhere and, and nobody took any notice and I've seen him out fly posted a couple of times you know he just double park the car with the hazard flashes on get the bucket and paste out the back of the car and just fly post in the middle of the day nobody took any notice at all so so we started this fly posting campaign for real life music and we put together three three radical organizations and uh, those three were, were the, the People's Paper, RIB, the Rights and Information Bureau in, in Charles Street, and Cardiff Women's Action Group, which was sort of pre-runner really to, to Cardiff Women's Aid and the whole of the Welsh Women's Aid. It was the first, um, Cardiff Women's Aid was the first Women's Aid in Wales. And, and the people involved led all the way through that. Um, so the three of us got together and basically we just took over the, the Mont Rents Club in Charles Street once a week, we did a, a deal as you did deals in those days. You, you met someone, you talked through the ideas, shook hands on it and off you went. So there was no contracts, no formal arrangements. We just did a deal with the club that we'd take the gate money because midweek was very, very quiet. And he'd have the bar take-ins and provide all the staff. We, we did the, the staff on the door and, um, and then we booked bands. And booking bands, I'd never booked bands before in my life. I just put our phone number on the posters. We managed to find a couple of local bands from Cardiff for the first couple of weeks. I just put a little bit on the bottom of the poster that said, if you want to play, ring this number. And within about a week, I had a queue of about six or eight bands, all scheduled all the way through. They just wanted to play. And we didn't mess with playing exp paying expenses or anything. They just wanted to pay. And for bands that come from, you know, up the valleys or a bit further afield or even just on the outskirts of Cardiff, the ability to get to play in a city centre club is, is a great sort of shop window for them, really. And clearly, you know, record touts and, and managers and so on would come and, and come to the club and listen because it was so eclectic. We had no real idea of, of who we were booking at all, you know. I never, I never asked anybody anything about what they played. If they wanted to play and they were coming to do it for nothing, then that was fine. You know. And um, we, we made what today would be quite considerable amounts of money. I think we were taking something like 50, 60 quid on the door every, every week. So, you know, it's a couple of hundred quid a month. Um, quickly totted up and in, in 1970s money, you know, that, that's up to like 1,000, 1,500 a month that we were making. Purely in cash, simply distributed between those three groups. Well, Cardiff Peace Shop was actually in the premises that, um, that we started the printing co-op in. And I started the printing co-op, I talked earlier on about the, the Hook Road and the, and the struggle against the Hook Road. Well, the council, as part of the sort of 
pre-process leading up to the, to the Hook Road had bought quite a lot of houses. They'd started on compulsory purchase, even though they didn't have full consent and, and hadn't done the public consultation to build the road. They started buying up the houses. And as part of that, they bought a couple of, of shops. Um, one of the things that happened um, after they'd lost, they started to sell the housing off, and there was a big campaign, which the People's Party wasn't particularly involved in. It was, it was starting to fall apart by then. Um, but also, I think we were, we were slightly ambivalent about it. There was, there was a big campaign to try and stop the sell-off of the houses and for the council to let them instead to people on the, on the waiting list. Um, we had a bit of a struggle um, as, to, as to what to do because at the same time they put up, I think, about seven or eight commercial premises for sale. Um, one of them was in Violet Row that we, we looked at that was enormous and still half of it still stands empty all these decades later um, with very extensive very old premises because Violet Row sits down below Cruz Road you know it's, it's a story and a half down um, so part of the premises were down there and part of them came out onto the onto the main road so they were quite big premises and um, and it was just by a blind auction you know you just put in a bid to the council and um, we put in a bid for that that failed but we also put in a bid for a shop in 56 Macintosh Place and, um, and got it. But as I say, there was, a, there was a dilemma because there was this whole campaign against not buying up the houses. And although we weren't buying up a house, we were buying up a, a shop premises, it was still one of those things that you, you had to think about very carefully. You know, should this be part of the campaign or not? But we took the pragmatic view, um, the, the four of us that were starting at the printing co op, that we'd just go for it anyway. You know. And because part of the shop was residential, we also qualified for a potential for getting a, a, a domestic mortgage. So we applied to Cardiff Council. Back in those days, Council still gave out house mortgages, particularly to people who, who were on fairly low incomes, which we were. So we successfully got a Council mortgage that went about halfway, I think, towards buying the premises and had to borrow the rest and bought shop. And that's where we started the, the printing co-op. We did the screen printing for the, the real live music out of that shop and that's where eventually we bought a little litho press and, and started up general printing and, and grew and grew and grew and uh, in the end took over the whole shop premises with massive machinery you could hardly get in the door. But that shop originally had been a, that, which is also very interesting I think, it had been a French polishers, funny little old man, who was a very keen purchaser of the Cardiff People's Paper and, and I can remember him so well seeing him there, you know, and he'd open the door and, and all you could smell was the alcohol from the from the French Polish little stoop top man, you'd buy it, and it was a really shabby little shop. I mean, it was it was filthy. One of the things he used to do was light fires to melt the shellac before he'd mix it with the alcohol to make the, the French Polish. So there were burn holes in the floor. He used to you know, imagine this, you know, in the middle of a terrace of houses, alcohol on a fire. <laughs> but he was reckoned to be the finest French polisher, and he did all of the big pianos if they had a little scratch or whatever. You know, they, they would send him up to him on a van, he would fix it. So he eventually became too ill and, and moved away. That's how the house became, the, the, the shop became vacant, the council bought it. We then bought it and, and started it up. And um, I knew quite a lot of people in the peace movement and we'd done quite a lot of printing for, for people in the peace movement. We, I mean, I'm very much a pacifist myself. And um, they started the idea of, of peace shops. You know, the, the, you know, the Cold War was really at its peak. Um, the campaign for nuclear disarmament was, was really, really taken off across the UK. CND groups were forming everywhere. There was a CND Cymru and a CND Cardiff. And I think it was Brighton that started the first peace shop. The idea that you would actually take over a shop and start selling all of the paraphernalia that people like, you know, car stickers, um, bumper stickers, t-shirts, you know, um, uh, flags and, and banners and and, and cards, greeting cards, all you know, pamphlets, copies of Peace News, all of this stuff. And and one day, a, a lady called Alison McPherson, who was very involved in the in the peace movement, uh, she walked in the door. She was she was after getting some stuff printed, and she said, you know, I'm I'm really really interested in in getting a shop, you know. And at that time, we had completely outgrown the shop, and we were looking for more premises. And, and coincidentally, although it had changed hands. We were looking at buying a 
another one of the Hook Road properties that someone had bought and it had been a, a crisp warehouse of all things um, tucked up a lane at the top so we were already negotiating with the with the, the, the sellers of this property and she walked in she said you know we're really after a shop I said well how do you fancy this one you know and she said oh well I said look we'll do a deal you know we'll get we'll appoint a neutral valuer we no idea what it's cost we won't mess with estate agents we'll appoint a neutral valuer put a middle market price on it shake hands on it we'll do the deal and and that's it you know and save all the costs etc 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 so she went back to a couple of other people and and said yes we do it and um, and so we we arranged a sale to turn it into the peace shop well sadly i'm not very good at saying no so when they asked me to help i said yes and they decided that we really wanted to make it into a co-op there was about um, a dozen of us because the shop had been bought originally with um, three donors who would put up quite large amounts of money um, to buy it thousands of pounds each um, to buy it and they couldn't quite get enough money and we did a, another slightly dodgy deal I suppose really which the bank manager didn't like because um, we were borrowing money in order to, to buy these other premises um, so I was constantly dealing with the with the bank manager so I just I upped the amount that I was borrowing and then lent it back to the peace shop as it was emerging um, but what he realized eventually was that whilst I'd done that and hadn't quite told him the truth about where I was what I was using the money for he'd already turned the peace shop down for a loan so he ended up effectively though the co-op bank ended up effectively lending money to someone that he'd already turned down for a loan which they weren't that pleased about but there was nothing they could do about it so so between that loan that we put in and and three other people's large amounts of of money again put in on, on loans we managed to, they they managed to buy the shop and then i spoke to someone else and we spoke to someone else and we managed to form a cooperative society and i became the secretary so i became really then quite heavily involved in the peace shop having sold them the premises and also lent them or, or organized to, to lend them some money which didn't come from me technically it came from the, from from the uh, from the printing co-op so it became immediately quite a big success um, got to, although it's not the, the best location when they, they had at the time looked around for locations but I think it was £45,000 a year rent on Queen Street at the time and we sold them the shop for 18 and a half grand so you know they got paid a third of a, of a year's rent and got the shop but it's a bit, it's a bit out of town but um, just around the corner from Albany Road a busy shopping street so it managed to build up quite a trade and being the only one in, in South Wales people came from all over and a lot of people would call in um, you know they're coming into to Cardiff on a Saturday um, coming in to, to do a bit of shopping in town they'd park around the corner they'd come in the pea shop have a cup of tea with us you know pick up a few things and, and move on into town and we started to realize then the possibilities of, of if we could just get in the center of town without paying a, a huge amount of money what we could do so it wasn't me it was it was um, Alison Jackson I think who was one of the other um, leading lights in it she knew people in the council and started talking about getting permission to go down onto the Hayes and set up a stall you know we have the we have the Christmas markets and things down on the Hayes now well none of that existed there were no um, stalls down there there was a there was a vegetable stall outside David Morgan's but there was nobody actually on the on the Hayes and it had just become a pedestrianized precinct so there were some negotiations that, that that were done and which I wasn't part of but somehow or other we got permission to set a stall up there on a on a Saturday on a on a regular weekly basis 52 weeks of the year if we wanted to so we started off by buying a, a market stall so I just looked in in Exchange and Mart it's where you I mean you buy stuff on the internet now if you want to find stuff that's a bit off the wall but Exchange and Mart was where you went in those days so bought a copy of Exchange and Mart found somebody sold uh, market stalls you know this sort of bit of canvas and, and all the steel framework that locks together and um, simply took it down in the back of the estate car so we set that up for a few weeks and we realized then that you know with other people had to come in with with cars with all the, the goods we'd set it all up we had to get 
down there at the end of the day and two or three cars to take your stuff away. So we thought, why don't we get something a little bit more permanent? So I said, well, why don't we get a caravan? So we looked in the South Bose Echo, found a caravan sale, 150 quid, second hand caravan, quite nice, tucked away on a, on a farm up, uh, up past Rogerton somewhere. Wandered up, saw it, cash changed hands, got a caravan, parked it on the street outside my house, which fortunately I was on a, a street that backed onto a school, so there was nobody living on the other side, so there was lots and lots of parking space. You weren't putting it in front of someone's house, so no one was going to object. So we just parked it on the street, and, uh, and every week I would hitch it up behind the car, tow it into town, set it up. We still had the market stall, so we used the market stall like sort of awning set up on the front and we kept all the goods in the in the caravan and we shared the keys around so people could just come down to the caravan open it up while it's parked opposite my house I'm going there check the stock you know put more stock in so that everything was just right for the time and uh, and we did that on a regular basis for I don't like to think how many years and um, we had this old caravan it was a, it was a Bailey caravan two birth Bailey caravan made in, made in Bristol Bailey's still going but um, a really nice quality, very old fashioned, but a really nice quality built caravan. So it, it, it lasted quite well, got a bit bashed around, but uh, it lasted quite well. And we did so well selling stuff in, in town like that, we decided in the end we'd get a proper store, you know, like a, like a hot dog store with a great big square boxy thing with a big side that opens up and side curtains to, to protect it from the wind and so on. So I found a manufacturer, again, good old exchange Mar again found a manufacturer who made these things and we we were making decent profit you know we were a not-for-profit um, co-op but that doesn't mean you don't make a profit it's just that the profit was accumulated and, and used for various things partly um, paying off the uh, you know paying off the loans for buying the shop but also we were accumulating money in the bank so I think it was about 1500 quid something like that for a for a market stall so we commissioned it, you know, they were all built to order. You chose the size and style that you want, size of opening, etc. Got all that made up, went and collected that, towed it back. Um, it was a bit of a beast compared to the caravan. Very, very substantial, but very heavy as a, as a consequence. So we took that into town all the time, but the, the only problem with both of them was we could never get any insurance. We just could not find an insurance company that would license what they regarded as a hot dog, would, would insure what they regarded as a hot dog store. We kept it, but it wasn't the sort of thing really you could keep on the street anymore. You know, it's so obviously a, a commercial thing, it's the sort of thing that, that attracted um, objections. So we found a farm up in, in Lisvane and paid them, I think it was um, a pound a week or something, to store it there. But unfortunately there was no security and one day, although it had locks on it and wheel clamps and, and everything else, one day got stolen. And that's the point at which we we gave up running the stall in town. We thought, well, trade was starting to drop a bit anyway, but uh, we thought, no, we'll give up. But we did we did have some very, very busy periods. And also, um, other things that we did with the shop were, there were very few um, very few cards around, that, you know, with, with peace themes. So we struck on the idea of producing Christmas cards, which we printed in the, in the printing co-op. Um, we got a, a, a local artist to design them again, all you know, free of charge. And um, and we printed them. And I think from the figures that we could manage to glean, we were far and away the largest producer of Christmas cards for the peace movement anywhere in the UK. I think it's fair to say, really, we started the peace Christmas card movement for you know of of, of coloured ribbons and, and doves of peace and so on, which every commercial producer picked up in the end but we just advertised them in the uh, in the small ads in the back of the observer again you know one of the ways that lots of stuff got sold was in the small ads in the sunday papers you took out a little tiny advertising box and we were selling something like a hundred thousand cards um, every christmas so it was it was big business all off by mail order so massive massive business which again made quite a lot of money that that sustained the peace shop and the peace shop eventually um gave up the shop and we sold it on to a, a solicitor who specialised in working with mental health clients. 
know, very much um, campaigning for, for better conditions for them. He'd also, um, his, his wife had been involved in the peace shop on the, on the periphery. She'd been one of the, the many, many volunteers, because the peace shop was run again entirely by, by volunteers, of which I was one, but there were dozens and dozens of others. And people who contributed. We had a system where people could make a stand in order contributing. And um, eventually we, you know, we decided that the shop was, 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 all the loans were paid off. There was a bit of money in the bank. So we sold it on again. And um, I think I gave you the wrong figures before because I think I'm right in saying that the 18,500 was what we sold it for. I think we bought it for six and a half actually. So that, that makes a bit more sense. So we sold it off for eighteen and a half thousand plus the money we had in the bank and set the peace shop up then as a sort of peace fund, really, funding various other peace campaigns. Put some money into an organization called Shared Interest, which you you, you may have heard of. It's a it's a micro loan business, it makes loans right the way across the third world. And it's called Shared Interest because they collect the interest on the on the micro loans. And they ask people who invest in it not to take the interest. So the interest is, is left and is, is shared for, for future use. So we put some money in there and we gave money off to, to various um, peace associated campaigns and eventually spent the fund out and, and wound it up. But in a, you know, wound up in a, in a good way, I think. So that was really good. Another spin off that came from that was the um, South of Morgan Peace Festival which again was, was Alison Jackson's baby. She had good contacts in the, in the council and persuaded them through the education department to support the Peace Festival. And they did um, a competition and, and, and the, one, of the, one of the parts of the competition was designing cards. So some of the later um, Peace cards came through the, the school kids' competitions for, for designing cards and produced a great big wall chart all about the peace movement that came out each year um, you know talking about examples talking about examples of how people got involved in the peace movement but but this went out through all of the schools so all of the schools got engaged in the design process and the winning cards were all reproduced on this great big broadsheet that the schools could, could pin up as well so and that continued for a number of years after the peace shop had finished I, I believe it's now stopped but that again was Although in a, it had some official sanction and it had a grant from, from the council, it was very much run through volunteer and effort of, of Alison and a couple of others, and the volunteer time that the teachers put in, because it wasn't part of the curriculum, so it was their extracurriculum activities. So I think that that sums up the peace shop and and, and the engagement with the stall, and. Um, I guess, you know, to a, to a very small extent, we started that change. We proved to the, to the public and to the council that they could quite easily run stalls on the town there. Um, so other, you know, there've been other temporary stalls that run there. There was, there was once um, a food market was there for a very short period of time. And there's the regular Christmas stall. So the center of town there in, in the way we've got temporary stalls set up, I think is, is to a very small extent from the pioneering work of the peace store. I think I quite profound I think some of the some of the changes. Um, you know the People's Paper um, ran some ran some big campaigns, you know, so there was there was the Hook Road. Um, there was the, the, the stuff that span out of it on the on the buses that made changes to the way the bus routes are operated. But you know stopping an, an enormous redevelopment scheme. We ran campaigns against the original R Ravenseft redevelopment of Cardiff City Centre, which was going to be fairly bonkers. It was going to end up a bit like the Boring in Birmingham, but actually probably slightly worse. The idea of the Ravenseft development was to jack the entire city centre up by a, a story so that all of the shopping would be on the first floor and all of the ground floor, all of the city centre space would be a car park. So pretty radical transformation. So we campaigned strongly against that and defeated that. But I think in a, in a slightly wider way, um, we made those sorts of radical campaigns possible and, and, and respectable. You know, there, were, there was solid citizens in there, you know, when Jane Hutt was one of the, uh, the people involved in the People's Paper, going on to be a 
you know, very well respected AM and, and minister. Um, we had a couple of university lecturers in there. So, you know, we were, we, we were a mixture of, of working class and, and middle class people. So we had those sort of middle class connections to help do things. But the fact it came out as a properly printed paper gave people the idea this was the sort of thing that, that they should take a bit of notice of rather than just a bunch of people with, with placards. You know, we gave it a certain amount of respectability. I think the, um, as, as I touched on earlier on, you know, the stuff about um, the idea of, of market stalls, you know, we've got things like um, the, the Riverside um, Farmer's Market now, which is all run on the street, and I don't think that would have happened unless we got this idea that, that put in markets on the street, which happens perfectly well and, and has always happened perfectly well over most of the most of Europe and, and half of America and used to be really quite uh, quite common in the UK um, but but had been had been damaged and destroyed part of the city center redevelopment took away the old Hayes fruit market down at the, the bottom end of the Hayes where you didn't have the sort of temporary market stalls you had little wooden boxes lockups that, that stayed there all the time it was very much you know a street market and, and that was all removed in the redevelopment so I think we started to to, to bring a little bit of that back again, I think the, uh, the, the you know the work that we did in real live music um, certainly seems to have helped a number of bands. And if you start googling around, um, you know you, you'll find a, a number of people still chatting about the good old days when they played in the Montmorents. I can't say for certain that was on our Wednesday nights, but I think it probably was. So, you know, it's it set a number of people going in the in the music scene. It helped to develop a music scene in in Charles Street, where now we've got, of course, you know, the community-run um, recording studios and so on. So, so there's those sorts of sorts of impacts. Um, it got groups working together. You know, we were, we were a partnership of three different, quite different radical groups with quite different sort of agendas, um, uh, working together to, to raise money. We we got the idea that you don't have to just entirely rely on grants. You can be self-sustaining through your own activities which is something that we see more and more now you know the whole sort of community shares issue idea that um, you raise money from the public and in invest in good things that are essentially voluntary run you know i think that's that's a, a long way you can't trace a direct link but i think we were part of a process that started to change that we certainly weren't alone you know similar activities were taking place right the way across the uk we, we weren't unique here in Cardiff, but we were part of that greater movement. Um, in terms of other changes, certainly, the, you know, the shape of Cardiff has changed. Um, we got things like the, um, the campaign against the barrage, the, the campaigns that came in Riverside after the flooding, um, which, which really heightened I think the, 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 the memory of that heightened the campaign against the barrage which was completely unsuccessful we ended up with the barrage which fortunately because of the changes that they that they've made to water quality and so on hasn't been as damaging as it could have been but I still think personally it's a bit of a waste of time you know changing and redeveloping South Cardiff that's been largely positive although not entirely so because um, it's been a bit of a mishmash with the the Cardiff Bay Development Corporation, who never really had a proper plan, didn't really quite know where they were going. They were just steering along from day to day, wherever they, uh, wherever the private developers would lead them by the nose, is is where they ended up going. But I, I never felt personally, because I campaigned very strongly against the barrage, I never felt personally that the barrage did any good. I could never see what was wrong with the tide going in and out. Personally, you know, it looked pretty hideous when the rusty Ford Cortinas appeared. But if you're taking away the rusty Ford Cortinas, um, there was nothing wrong with a, with a bit of mud and some bits of the old dockside that poked out when the tide went out and uh, you know the wading birds that, uh, that lived on the mud etc. You know, I could never see anything wrong with that. The, the docks were tatty and the docks needed, uh, needed upgrading and improving and we've got some magnificent stuff down there like uh, you know the Millennium Centre and, and so on and um, the old D shed with the artists uh, gallery in it and so on you know there's, there's a number of, of great things the conversion of the uh, of the old dry dock to make the uh, the rolled dial plaza now in, in the old roth basin you know there's been some fantastic improvements down there but they're nothing to do with 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 the the concrete wall that makes it awkward for the boats to get in and out 
So I think you know those sorts of sorts of changes have, have come about because of that sort of that that respectability for being radical and and campaigning that I think to a certain extent we kicked off in the in the People's Paper and has continued with lots and lots of other people's effort ever since. Okay. And, and what does volunteering mean to you? Um, I think volunteering is is it's about giving back really. You know, it's, and I think it's it's really important because it's a different relationship with a with a project or a, or a plan or a campaign than if you pay to do it. I mean, obviously, we all have to earn a living somewhere. So, volunteering can only come from people who've got a bit of time and space in their lives to do the volunteering. It can't, you know, it can't fix everything. But it's a totally different relationship. It's a much more powerful relationship that you have as a volunteer because of the time and energy. That you're giving, and I think it's been something that's been there in the, you know, in the British way of life, for for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. That people see something that needs doing, join together in a group, and just get on and fix it. You know? I think that that's really powerful, and, and long may it continue. What do you think volunteering has given you personally? Um, it's given me a huge amount of experience. I've met some some fantastic people. Um, got a real sense of achievement for the things that we've we've managed to do. Um, filled the gap in my life, but there probably wasn't a gap there. To, so you know, it puts extra pressure on you. There are downsides to becoming a very keen volunteer. You know, you do end up neglecting certain other aspects of your life, trying to squeeze too many things in. Particularly if, like me, you find it difficult to say no to things. But I, you know, I, I do get immense pleasure from it. I have to say, a deep sense of, of satisfaction. You know, I'm 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 not Christian. I'm quite a militant atheist in in many ways. But you know, it's this bit in the Bible about it's better to give than to receive. And I think, um, you know, giving is a very pleasurable activity. And volunteering is about giving to society. All right. Thank you very much.